Recently, I came across an amazing channel called Animated Horror Stories, which features illustrated and animated horror stories, none of which I'd ever heard of before. Animated Horror Stories have provided all the animation and illustration in today's video. Personally, I've enjoyed all the stories that they've had on their channel, and it'd be great if you could check it out. So I've left a link in the description below. Today we are looking at a case from the early 19th century. So sit back as we go to England. Elizabeth Fenning was born on the 10th of June 1793 in Dominica. And although she was christened Elizabeth, her parents always referred to her as Eliza. Her father William served in the British Army and was stationed on the beautiful Caribbean island. The British had established a base there following the Treaty of Paris in 1783, which had returned Dominica to British control. Elizabeth and her parents lived on the island until 1797, when her father's regiment returned to Britain. William then left the army, and after a brief period in his wife's hometown of Cork in Ireland, the family moved to England, eventually settling in London. William found accommodation in Holborn, an area in the centre of the city, in the borough of Camden, and he started to work with his brother, who owned a potato wholesale business. William was a hard and honest worker, and while he spent long hours working in the city, his wife Mary was employed as a seamstress. London was an overcrowded place. The air was filled with soot and smoke, and horses moved both people and goods. It was the home to Britain's largest port, and as trade increased, People came from all over the country to find work in London. In the early 19th century, the population had reached over one million, and even though there was an abundance of work, life for the poorer in the community was often difficult. Like most children from less well-off families, Eliza was sent to work as soon as her parents were able to secure her employment. The Industrial Revolution had meant that there were far more positions available, and the average age for a child to start work in 1800 was 10 years old. Eliza worked in various places before eventually securing a role as a cook in the service of Mr. Olibar Turner. He was a gentleman who owned a business selling articles used by lawyers and making copies of legal documents. He lived in a fine house at 68 Chancery Lane with his wife Margaret, his son Robert and his son's wife named Charlotte. The family also employed a maid named Sarah Peer and two young gentlemen who were employed as apprentices. Eliza had attended school and her parents had brought her up to be a hard-working and respectful young lady. She started in service at the Turner residence in January 1815. By now she was 21 years old and as well as being quite charming, she was also very attractive. She was often approached by young men who asked to court her but Eliza always declined their requests, as she had become engaged a few months prior to securing her position in the Turner household. Mr. Turner's daughter-in-law named Charlotte took charge of the domestic staff. She would arrange what food needed to be ordered and what meals Eliza should prepare. She did not seem to be very fond of the cook that her father-in-law had employed and was not very friendly towards her. Eliza, however, just concentrated on what she needed to do and tried not to let her mistress's misgivings bother her. Things did not seem to improve, and late one evening, Mrs. Charlotte Turner found Eliza in the bedroom of one of the apprentices. According to Mrs. Turner, Eliza was inappropriately dressed, and incensed by her behaviour, she threatened to dismiss her from her position as cook. Eliza claimed that she had only gone to the room to fetch a candle. Nevertheless, Mrs. Turner still considered her behaviour not befitting a young lady, and especially not a young lady employed in the Turner household. Eliza accepted that Mrs. Turner disapproved of her actions and offered her an apology, and although Mrs. Turner did not dismiss her, the incident only made what was an already uncomfortable relationship even worse. Eliza was particularly upset by Mrs. Turner's accusations. She was respectable and hard-working, and even though she did not come from a rich and distinguished family like her mistress, 
She still thought that her moral character should not be questioned. Eliza confided in Sarah Peer, the maid, and told her that she no longer liked Mrs. Charlotte Turner. Eliza had asked Mrs. Turner on a number of occasions if she may be allowed to make dumplings for the family, but Mrs. Turner never permitted this. She always claimed that the family were not very fond of dumplings. On Monday the 20th of March, Eliza entered the dining room and informed Mrs. Turner that the brewer had delivered some yeast. The following day, Tuesday the 21st of March, Mrs. Turner went to the kitchen and told Eliza that she may indeed prepare dumplings for dinner. Mrs. Turner, in fact, gave her precise instructions and told her to first make a beefsteak pie for the apprentices. Eliza made the pie and prepared the dumplings, exactly as Mrs. Turner had instructed, with flour, yeast, milk and water. She then left the dumplings cooking while she went to the baker's. When she returned, she was shocked, as the dumplings had not risen. She was both worried and disappointed, but she thought that she had no choice other than to serve them. Three family members sat down for dinner. Mr. Olibar Turner, his son Robert, and Robert's wife, Charlotte. Charlotte looked at the dumplings and immediately said that they looked black and heavy instead of white and light. But despite their appearance, the family ate them. Very soon after, they were all feeling quite unwell. Charlotte had excruciating pain in her stomach, as did her husband Robert and her father-in-law, Mr. Olibar Turner. It was not only the three family members who were ill. Eliza was also in a very bad way, complaining of severe stomach ache and vomiting. As the evening progressed, Mr. Turner became very concerned for his son, who seemed to be particularly poorly. So he asked Sarah Peer to fetch a doctor. At around nine o'clock, some six hours after the family had eaten, a local surgeon named Mr. John Marshall arrived at 68 Chancery Lane. It did not take long for him to realise that all the symptoms suggested that the family had been poisoned. The following day, Mr. Marshall conducted an experiment on the bowl that the dumplings had been prepared in, and he found it to contain traces of arsenic. He also conducted experiments on the yeast and the flour, which he found to contain no traces of the poison. The police were called and discovered that two wrappers of arsenic were also kept in an unlocked drawer in the office where the apprentices worked. But some time before March the 21st, it was noted that they were missing. The drawer also contained pieces of old paper used to light the fire. It was reported that Eliza had been seen near the drawer around the time that the arsenic had gone missing. Two days after the incident, on the 23rd of March, Eliza was arrested and charged with four counts of administering poison with intent to murder. The trial began just three weeks later, on Tuesday the 11th of April 1815. The prosecution brought forward many witnesses. Mrs Charlotte Turner informed the court that she imagined that Eliza had put poison in the dumplings as she was unhappy that she had reprimanded her for entering the apprentice's bedroom. She added that the defendant acted differently towards her following the incident. The maid, Sarah Peer, said that Eliza had told her that she was upset and no longer liked the mistress. She also confirmed that she personally had not suffered any illness on the day, and although she had eaten some of the steak pie, she did not eat any of the dumplings. One of the apprentices, named Roger Gadston, said that when he went to the kitchen on Tuesday the 21st of March, he saw some dumplings on the table and thought he would eat them. He ate a small amount, but the defendant quickly told him not to. He told the court, but Eliza had said that it would do him no good to eat them. He later became quite ill. When asked if she had made him dumplings previously, he replied that she had, but they looked and tasted very different. He also told the court that the drawer where the arsenic was kept was the same one where the paper was stored to light the fire. He said that the defendant had access to the drawer and he had noticed that the poison had gone missing about two weeks before the incident. Both Mr. Turner and his son Robert testified. Both explained what had happened on the 21st of March and how unwell they both felt. William Thistleton, the arresting police officer, was called to give evidence. He informed the court that when he arrested Eliza, 
He asked her whether she thought that there may have been something in the flour, but she said that she had used the same flour to make the beefsteak pie. She did say, however, that she had noticed a red sediment at the bottom of the yeast. She also wondered if something had been added to the milk that had been collected by the maid, Sarah Peer. Mrs. Margaret Turner, the lady of the house, was not present at dinner, but when she gave her testimony, she said that when she arrived back at 68 Chancery Lane, she found Eliza to be very poorly indeed, with the same symptoms as her husband, son and daughter-in-law. When Dr. Marshall took the stand, he confirmed that he had found no traces of arsenic in the yeast, only in the bowl used to make the dough. Five witnesses were called to testify to Eliza's good character, but the other apprentice named Thomas King, who would testify that whenever she needed paper for the fire, she had always asked him for it, was denied his turn on the witness stand. Eliza made a statement. She addressed the packed courtroom, telling them, I am truly innocent of all charges. As God is my witness, I am innocent. Indeed I am. I liked my place. I was very comfortable. As to my master saying I did not assist him, I was too ill. I had no concern with the drawer at all. When I wanted a piece of paper, I always asked for it. When the judge summed up the case, he seemed to strongly suggest to the jury that all the evidence pointed to the defendant being guilty of the crime. The jury only deliberated for a few minutes before finding Elizabeth Fenning guilty and the judge sentenced her to death. The majority of the public were against her sentence. The evidence against the young lady was only circumstantial and although attempted murder carried a maximum sentence of death, it was considered by most but leniency should have been shown. Newspapers protested against the verdict and a campaign was launched to commute the sentence. Petitions were raised, which even Eliza's employer, Mr. Orley Turner, seemed prepared to sign. But he was advised that if he did, the case again may be looked into and another may be found responsible. So after consideration, he did not sign it. The case was reviewed by Lord Sidmouth, the Home Secretary, and Lord Eldon, who was a Lord Chancellor, but they concluded that the conviction and sentence should stand. On Wednesday the 26th of July 1815, Elizabeth Fenning was taken to the gallows, and in front of a crowd of tens of thousands of people, she declared her innocence before she was hanged. Following the execution, many angry people went to 68 Chancery Lane, which was the home of the Turners. They gathered outside shouting that Eliza was innocent. The crowds came back the next day, so the authorities ordered that two policemen be stationed outside the house, with the instruction to arrest anyone causing a disturbance. William Fenning had to pay the executioner's fees before he was given his daughter's body for burial. On Monday the 31st of July, five days after her execution, Elizabeth Fenning was buried at St George's the Martyr Churchyard in Bloomsbury. Thousands of people formed the funeral procession, all believing her to be innocent. The story of Eliza Fenning was still very much in the public's mind and continued to be reported. One story emerged that her father had visited her the day before her execution and asked her that if she was guilty to not confess to the crime, as if she did, it would ruin his own reputation. Another story was that he had let people view her body in return for a small payment. Most people considered these accusations to be untrue and thought they were nothing more than a legal establishment trying to justify their verdict. The owner of 68 Chancery Lane, Mr. Olibar Turner, was declared bankrupt in 1825. Three years later, his son Robert died in a workhouse. Hello everyone and thank you so much for listening and thank you so much for Animated Horror Stories for doing this wonderful animation of this case. There is a link to the Animated Horror Stories channel below. As usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have and I will see you in the next brief case.